July 4th weekend. Fine, fine. Uh, we kind of had an unusual weekend because uh, um, just to be different from everybody else, we spent kind of our weekend watching Obi-Wan Kenobi. Anybody a Star Wars fan? Yeah, that was a... That was a if you're a Star Wars fan, extremely recommend it. Spend those six, six hours watching the series. It uh, really brings you back a lot of nostalgia. It was really good. Uh, we also didn't barbecue. You know, everybody likes to barbecue on Monday morning. We actually were crazy enough to drive to, China, uh, San, uh, to Clement Street in San Francisco to visit our old uh, dim sum places and, you know, grabbed it and, and went home and had our, our July 4th kind of luncheon before we had to take the kids back to school. So... Uh, it, it was good. It was good. Different, but good. It's good to be different sometimes. Uh, I, I may be taking to you, talking to you about the Golden State Warriors one more time, you know. Uh, the fact that they won the finals, it doesn't happen every every year. It, you kind of want to kind of stretch it as long as you enjoy it, as long as you can. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to bring mention to you. The talk of the series was uh, very important for us to recognize that the commentator was saying it, it, one win, one loss does not define the series, okay? Because they, they had a different playoff games. Every time they lost, everybody thought, oh, it's the end of the world. Every time they won, they were on top of the hill. So it's an interesting definition. One win, one loss does not define the series, but to focus on the journey and win one series at a time. You know, sometimes we get two ups and downs, depending on what we hear in the news. Uh, sometimes it's where we see in social media affects who we are, affects how the way we think. And sometimes, you know, we let it get down on ourselves instead of just staying even keel. It's the journey that's more important than one win and one loss in the series. So speaking of journeys, uh, one of the storylines in this series was the comeback of Clay Thompson, right? Uh, I don't know if you remember this, his story. Uh, I believe it was in the 2019 final. He sustained an injury that required surgery and a whole year rehab, right? He rehabbed for the whole year and he came back and he got hurt again. And he's like, yeah, they, then, then he rehabbed for another year and he came back and he didn't come back 100%, little by little. He got better and better and better. And my question was like, would he ever question himself? Like, you know, people are going to rehab, sometimes you ask yourself, is this worth it, you know, to go to one more therapy, one more pain, one more stretch? You know, was there any point in time that he says, you know, I, I can't endure these trials anymore? So the question is, since he made it, since he walked through it, since he's a champion, the question you should ask is, what motivated him? And I went, I'm going to venture to say that one of the reasons that motivated him to endure the trials, to endure every single therapy session, every ups and downs, is his love for the game. Right? There's, there's a love that propels you, that motivates you to continue. There's something that, that grabs your heart and says, you got to keep going, don't give up. Why do I say that? Uh, uh, we're in the second chapter, the uh, second half of chapter 13, our study of organized chaos. Just to remind you, today's message is called Love Never Gives Up. Okay? Um, so what Paul is doing, if the, the treasure current is, some people are writing to him, saying, you know, Paul, we're in trouble. Right? And there's division, there's troubles, we can't get anywhere. Um, we, we were a church that has every talent, every spiritual gift that we can have, but we're still all divided. So Paul says the solution to you is to, for you each to reach and have the same mindset of God. What does that mean? That means that you need to, have, to think like Christ, speak like Christ, and act like Christ. That everything in you, whatever you do, whatever you say, whatever you choose, uh, it's you ought to reflect the character of Christ. And he says here, to the extent the missing ingredient is, is the fact that you lack agape love. Um, knowing what agape love sometimes will save you from all the difficulties and troubles you may have. Um, you know, many years, I think it was 15 years ago, we were doing a mission trip to Tijuana. Right, so because it was my first time there, I didn't stay in the other side of the border. So we decided to stay in a hotel, I think in San Isidro, and commute every day to Tijuana. We went down there, we met some missionaries, did an eye cleaning, and came back out. I remember one night, it was really in the, the border is really, traffic is bad, and it takes like hours just to get through the border and the customs. So uh, I'm driving there in my van with my wife and, th and three other ladies from my church, there, all, all three are Filipinas. And so we are stopped at the border, and the, the, the custom officer says, What are you doing here? He goes, Well, this is what we're doing, officer. Uh, they show me some ID, so I show him my ID. How about the ladies? They show my ID, but this, they look very suspicious. They're sitting in the back of the van, right? They're thinking like, uh, "Are you illegally transporting these people across?" 
goes, no, 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 this is, we're, we're just doing mission work. He goes, how do I know? Well, here is the Bible. You know, but he, it's interesting that the custom officer asked me one question. He goes, so you go to church? He goes, yeah, so what is the love chapter in, in the Bible? Love chapter in the Bible. The whole Bible is the whole love, love book of love. He goes, so I thought about it and I started sweating a little bit. He goes, what is he asking me for? So I said, oh, 1 Corinthians 13. He goes, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Save me, right? And, you know, from being stopped. And, you know. So sometimes this chapter that is so preached about in weddings applies more to weddings. He's, remember, he's right into a church in trouble. Uh, she's right into churches that's divided, there's problems going through, and beliefs, and, and, and there's arguments, there's suing, everything is going on, and says, you know, you need to stop and reflect the character, you need to stop and apply agape love. Now, what is agape love? Okay, in the Greek language, is four words for love. Agape love is God's unconditional love. Okay, um, we said it last Sunday, it's, it's God, it's a type of love that God is showing to you, it's in the cross. Right? It's, but it's the type of love that God wants to build in your life, too. We, we tend to be recipients of God's love, but we don't want to dispense God's love. And so what he's saying, he goes, you, I'm showing you what this love is about. I want you to receive it, and I want you to dispense it. I want you to filter to everything that you do, and you say, and you act. So agape love is unconditional. In simple terms, agape love is your commitment to put the best of the others first. Because that's what God did in the cross. Jesus put your, his best interest first. He went to the cross and died for you. Because not something that you wanted, but something that you needed. So agape love, again, is your commitment to put others first. The others' first interest first ahead of yours. Then agape love becomes the motivation behind the mindset of Christ. And it's, it is what brings joy in everything that you do and everything you say and everything you act upon. So, last Sunday, we ended up in verse 7. Okay, and verse 7 says the bridge between the first part and the last part of 1 Corinthians 13. Um, so, let's read it together. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says this, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Why is everybody so quiet this morning? I feel like a school teacher, right? Let's say it loud now. 1 Corinthians 13 says, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So, if you are striving after agape love, you say, I got this. But this is the way it expresses itself. So this is kind of your gauge to the day. You know, when I ask you, what's your meter in striving agape love, then you need to filter yourself, am I loving this way? Right? You can say, I got the love of Christ in me. Yes, you do. But it doesn't express yourself this way. I got the love of Christ in my life, but it doesn't express this way. In everything you think, in everything you say, in everything you act. Now, just a, just a brief uh, recap. Love bears all things means you have, you, you're saying to somebody, I got your back. You talked about the Golden State Warriors. It's Draymond Green telling the guard ahead of him, listen, guard him this way, make him go left. If he goes past it, don't worry, I got your back. Right? That's you telling somebody, the, your spouse, and your family, and your church, and community, you know, no matter what's going on in your life, I got your back. I'll be there for you. The next one is said, <clears throat> love believes all things. Now, this is the one that we have to park on a little bit. It doesn't mean you're gullible. Let me say love is blind, because sometimes love has to be tough, right? It doesn't mean you don't forgive, but it means that somebody has to earn your trust. It doesn't mean you're a doormat to somebody, but it does mean that when somebody earns your trust, you give them the benefit of the doubt. The next one is love hopes all things. It means that you don't think in worst case scenarios. You know, we live in this world that's that way, right? We'll be, uh, we're going to two, three years of COVID, and it kind of cut drains on you. Sometimes you, you think in worst case scenarios all the time, right? Something presents in yourself, you go, oh, yeah, this may happen. No, it may not happen, right? Now, somebody says that more than 95% of the things you worry about never happen. So why think about it that way, right? Again, love, hope, all things, you don't think in worst case scenarios. Last thing is, it says love endures things means love never gives up. That's what we're going to talk about. The love, the type of agape love that God wants to steal you never ever gives up. The type of love that says, you know, when everybody quits, you're still there. Um, I think I shared the example last week about parties, you know. We, perhaps you went to a barbecue party. Or did people invite you? Do you have many families along the way? Then when the party's over, everybody leaves. Right? Nobody, nobody wants to clean up. 
But this type of love says, you know, after everybody leaves, you say to the host, you know, can I help you? Right? You roll up your sleeve, you grab a garbage bag and start helping them out. You go to the sink and you see all these dishes, you say, decide to clean up. That's the God of love that he's talking about. A God of love is God's unconditioned. This is the way it exhibits itself. This is the way you filter every choice, every information, every circumstances you go through. And he's saying to the church, you know, one of the reasons you are have trouble, you have division and problems, is you're missing this in your life. You're missing a God of love. So here's the question. How do I get this stuff? Right? How do I receive it? How, and then what does it look like? So this morning, as we finish chapter 13, I'm going to show you three things about agape love that you, I want you to understand and I want you to apply to your life and your circumstances. Okay, here's the first one. First of three things. Agape love never gets used up. Okay? Uh, agape love never used up. The first verse in verse says, says love never fails. Okay, this kind of love that we're talking about never ever fails. Now, what does the word fail mean? The Greek word fail means it, it never ends, never quits. It keeps on coming. Think about this, all right? Love never fails means this type of love never ends. It quits. You can keep receiving it, you keep giving, you keep receiving, you keep giving it over and over again. Now, you hope that this, like, microchips, right? At some point, you know, there's not enough microchips to build, build, build cars. At some point, something ends up. You know, we all think about our retirement, and we think about, you know, do we have enough to retire until the end, right? At some point, would the money ever end? He says, this kind of love that never fails, never ends, never quits, keeps on coming. And the more you give, you receive it, the more you can give it. The more you give it, the more you can receive it. So where do I get this from? Now, I'm going to take you to the Old Testament. This is a story where God tells Elijah to visit a widow. You remember that, right? He goes visit a widow and, and, and then he says, you know, uh, I'm hungry. So the, the widow takes a look and he goes, well, you don't understand, mister. You know, I have enough flour to, for tonight for just me and my son. And after that, that's it. We're done. And he takes us to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 12, 14. Let me read it to you. Let me ask you, you know, if, if your, is your type of love running out? Is your type of love never good enough? Right? Then, then God keeps says, I want you to give giving, but he says, no, I don't. I, do, I can't because I don't have it. So, chapter, verse 12 starts this way. So she says, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar and see. I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my sons that we may eat it and die. How often does that happen, right? God says, here, I want you to give. And you're looking at yourself, well, you know, this is all I got. If I give it away, I'm, I'm done. I don't have anything else left for myself. So that's sometimes the excuse that we have when God says, love never gives us. I want you to receive it. I want you to dispense it. I want you to give it away. Sometimes it says, you know what? I don't have that kind of love. Because you want to keep it to yourself because you're afraid you're going to run out. Then the next slide says, and Elijah says to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterwards, make some for yourself and your son. Next life. For thus says the Lord your God of Israel, the bin for flowers shall never be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain into the earth. Did you hear that? Let me read it to you again. Thus says the Lord God is the bin of flour, the one that you're looking at, you're going to say you're going to run out, shall never be used up. See, it goes back. Again, agape love never gets used up. You got to understand, realize that. And you ask yourself, whenever you think that it's going to get used up, you guys, what kind of love am I exhibiting myself? You know why? Because it was the Lord God that was going to supply the flower. Right? God says, I want you to use it and share your love with this prophet. Don't worry about using that because I'm going to supply whatever you need. So she, she, she responded in obedience. She gave it to the prophet. And going back, guess what? There was more flour. And she made my bread, gave it to the, the prophet. Guess what happened? There was more flour. It never ran. Why? Because it came from God himself. 
So when you say love never fails, next slide. It's the understanding that God, the God that you know, the God that we know is love. And He's the giver of love. He's the supplier of love. As, as long as you're, you're, you're tied up within, you will never run out. So sometimes you ask yourself, why is it that I kind of feel like I'm running out of love? I think of two things, okay? One, you're using human love. Right? This is the, my humanism itself, the, the, the fact that I should be caring or empathetic. At some point or another, it's going to run out. It's not, not good enough. The second time I think it runs out is because you're starting to disconnect from God. Remember, agape love is the fruit of the Spirit. Right? It's supplied, supernatural supplied by God. If you're disconnected with God, there's no way, no how you're going to have this kind of love. You can fake it. You can say, I care, but it's not the agape love. Why? Because you're not connected with God. And these challenges to say whatever it is, I need to reconnect with Him. So, he starts by saying, this cup of love never gets used up because you know where it's coming from and you know where to get it. Now, he begins to say, you know, it's even better than the things that you're looking for. So, he's, he's, he begins to say in the next in the slides, it's love and never fail. He continues to say, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there's knowledge, they will vanish away. Now, uh, the, the gives this for another long sermon series, okay? But I'm just going to kind of briefly say, what he's saying is contrast, he's contrasting agape love against the gifts. And he's saying, this is the gift that you look for, but these gifts are even greater than the gift and the talents that you have. This is the gift that you look for, but they're meaningless if it's not mixed with love. So why do I say this? Because the church of Corinth, they wanted, they misunderstood and misapplied all these three gifts. Right? They, they had all the gifts that you can say. In fact, there's 18, 20 gifts. They're scattered to three different books of the Bible. But he says, you know, these are the gifts that they wanted so bad, they pushed it so hard that they misapplied it and, and led to trouble. Now, what is the gift that he's talking about? Prophecy, okay? It's the ability to speak the mind of God in light of what God's revealed in the Bible already. It's be able to look at the circumstances in life and says, you know, this is what God says according to what we're seeing through. It's a special gift that God gives to certain people, right? To say again, that he's able to speak the mind of God in light of what's been revealed in the Bible. It doesn't contradict the Bible. The gift of knowledge, um, Think about a calculus professor or somebody that teaches algorithms in computer science. There's stuff that, you know, I, I, I don't understand. Once in a while I ask my son, he teaches, and he says, what are you teaching? He goes, Dad, you're not going to understand. That's it. You go, okay, that's fine. But you teach that class all the time. So what does it mean? It's the ability to take something incomprehensible, right? Break it down into three pieces. And teach it and says, this is what it means, one, two, three, and they go, aha, now I get it. The gift of knowledge is some people in the church have that gift to take something so difficult, right, that you read it and you read it over, I don't get this. Then all of a sudden, they paint a picture, one, two, three, and oh, I got this. The last one is the gift of tongues. Now, there's an S in there, it means tongues, okay? So what this refers is to a, a gift to be able to speak a known language that you never learned before. Now there's, in the Bible, it talks about tongues with an S and tongue without an S. Let's just talk about the tongues with an S. The ability to speak the known language that you've never learned before. Okay? And, it, and it's meant to benefit unbelievers the same way that happened in Pentecost. And he says to this, you know, listen, having all those gifts that you're looking for means nothing. Right? If it's not based in love, if it's not done in love for the benefit of other people, you're doing it for yourself. So he says, in, instead of seeking all these gifts, start with love first. Instead of seeking all these gifts, all these titles, all these talents, all this power, seek love first. This is where it starts because when you got, got this kind of love, that's when you have the mindset of Christ for you. He doesn't even, he finishes, the, and he says in the next life, for we know in part, that we prophesy in part. That when that which is perfect comes, then that which is in part will be done away. And what does that mean? One, right? All these gifts without love is meaningless. But it says all these gifts 
are going to fade away one of these days. All these gifts that you're looking for, someday alone, agape love is going to outlast it. How do we know that? So, it says that even the greatest gifts that you're searching for, once they serve their purpose on earth, it will go away. Right? You're talking about tongues, the ability to speak a different language. I tend to say when the rapture comes, it, there, there's no need. Right? I, the, how about the gift of prophecy and the gift of uh, knowledge? When they end up the, the, the tribulations, the end, the end of the millennial kingdom, there's no, need, no more need because we're all going to be in heaven. But... When we get to heaven, when it says when perfect comes, when is perfect comes, when Jesus comes back, right? So that was the new, new kingdom of God. None of these gifts are going to be needed. But the one thing that's going to last in all is what? Agape love. That's what he says. Listen, above everything that you search for, right? The gifts, the talents, the power, the titles, nothing is as important as starting with agape love first. And whenever you feel like giving up, whenever you feel like, you know, I don't got enough, he says, you know what? This kind of love never fails. Why? Because God is love. Why? Because God is endless. And sometimes, listen, you're, you may go into a difficult struggle, whatever it may be in your life. You got to remember that agape love so is going to outlast everything that you're doing. Everything that you're hoping for. And that's why he says, you know, filter everything through agape love. He filter everything to this unconditional love that God has. And you see it. Um, because if you pursue things beyond that, this, those things will not last either. So, start with that. Agape love never gets you stuff. My question to you, are you seeking God? Now remember, it's the fruit of the Spirit. You cannot master, you cannot buy it. Love never lasts because sometimes you're using human love or you're disconnected with Him. So in order to get this agape love, you need to reconnect with Him. How do I do that? Right? Sometimes we forget. We go Sunday to Sunday, but we don't visit God every day. We don't walk with God. And it, it, sometimes it's not just it's that. It's when God says something to you, it says something to you. Sometimes we question Him, we doubt Him, we disobey Him, we go things our own way. So if you want this kind of love... My question to you, are you connecting with God? So look into your day, look into your week, look into your choices, look into your decisions, right? We went through it. Am I exhibiting agape love? Because if I'm not, then I'm not connecting with Him as a Christian. And that's a great challenge because there's so many choices, so many decisions that you and I need to make, so many circumstances that He says, you know what? You got to bathe it with this kind of love if you're going to walk with Him. So the next thing is, agape love is mature love, right? Um, we said it last week, agape love is a measure of your maturity in Christ. What, what is this? Um, uh, I remember, the time is passing by so quickly now, and when our kids are little, uh, I just love, I still look forward for Christmas. Um, I remember when our kids were little, uh, just the joy of watching them just opening gifts, right? We look forward for those times. But you know, kids are looking for some things and adults looking for some things that are totally different. Um, you ever watch a kid open a gift? You know, they, they just tear the whole thing. I mean, it doesn't matter how much you are careful you wrap the, the present. They just tear it all up. And they grab, they look for that one thing that catches their imagination, right? And they play and they play and they play and they play until it's done. But somehow they put it down and then they grab another gift. All of a sudden, that gift doesn't serve them anymore, so they grab another thing and start playing with them. Until somebody else comes along the way and they, they pick up their original gift, they start playing, no, that, I, that, I didn't put that, that's mine. Right? That gift is mine. Even though they just put it aside already. Agape love, this growth from, from self-centered to other-centered, is a measure of your maturity. Right? And again, gauge yourself where you are in agape love. But negate yourself is, if you're not maturing in Christ, ask yourself, how, how, where is my agape love? So, Paul says in verse 11, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. 
He's speaking to the church. He says, you know, you are speaking like a child. You're understanding that you're thinking like a child. Grow up. Why? Because they just thought if we had all these gifts, all these talents, everything in our disposal, that'd be good enough, right? It's like you're looking for a certain gift. They were looking for the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy. I want to have this. Why? Because that, that will thrust me up into the front of everybody in the class. And he's saying, listen, that's thinking like a child. I want you to grow up. And grow up means you put agape love. Why? Because agape love puts others first. So there's this growth process instead of thinking about this is my gift. I want this gift into, you know what? I'm going to use whatever I have for the benefit of others. So he's thinking, listen, you got to seek the things that are most important. Stop thinking like a child. Start thinking like an adult. Mature in Christ. Think of agape love first. He throws another explanation. He says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but when we went, then we'll see face to face. Now that I know in part, but then I should know that just as I'm also know. Now, you're going to understand mirrors. In the old days, mirrors were not flat. Okay? It's not like now you look in the mirror, you see yourself in every... The, every spot that you need to change, every, every uh, time that you need to shave. Um, but back then it was curved, right? The, the mirrors were curved. So when you look at yourself, it, 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 it wasn't quite a true image of who you are, right? If everything was kind of like going to the uh, circus and you see all these funny mirrors. But today you have flat mirrors and you see yourself of who you are. There's no hiding behind it. So what he's saying is, is listen, this, uh, there was one time when you have a blurred image of Christ. You had a blurred image of yourself. You had a blurred image of what you think were important in your life. But when Pentecost came, when the Holy Spirit came, and he showed you the Christ that was alive, you started to see more of who you are and the need for love. So he says to yourself, listen, when you meet Christ, Right? All of a sudden, all these doubts, all these fears, all the uncertainty become more clear to you. Because the Holy Spirit showed you Christ. And He's saying to you, there's going to be a come a time when you, when you get reconnected with God, when you come face to face with perfect love Christ. Right? That all of a sudden, all this, all this blur, all these problems, all this misunderstanding, all this lack of clarity will become clear. Why? Because you saw love. And he's saying to you, listen, if you, there are circumstances in your life, listen, that things are muddled, things are difficult, you don't understand, you know what step to take, you got to come face to face with love. Ahead of the talents, ahead of your choices, ahead of your titles, ahead of the power. Agape love is mature love. Right? Agape love is a measure of your whether you're growing in Christ or not. And we tend to think of ourselves that our measure is how many years we come to church? How many years that we serve? But that's not true. Because if agape love doesn't grow, then we're not growing. And that's the challenge. He's saying, it never gets juice up, in, 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 so you, you shouldn't give up. It also says that it's mature, so you should measure your spiritual maturity. And I'm going to finish up by saying this. Agape love is worth pursuing above everything else. Now again, you got to go back to what it means, okay? You got to go be straight on what it is and understand. Agape love is God's unconditional love, right? It's learning to commit yourself to put others first. It means it bears all things. I got you back. We believe all things. It doesn't mean you're gull gullible. It doesn't mean you're a doorman. But it believes it's a, the person in your trust, you give them the benefit of the doubt. Love hopes all things. It doesn't think in worst case in your love. It never gives up. Because as long as Christ is in the picture, things are never hopeless. So, agape love is worth pursuing above everything. Before you start anything, before you choose anything, before you're making your mind anything, choose to pursue agape love. Now he says this in verse 13. And now by faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now he just said, right? All these gifts without love is meaningless. 
And he just said, uh, this is greater than all these uh, uh, this gifts we're talking about. Now he's saying that, that this kind of love is greater than faith and hope. What are we talking about? So what is faith? Right? Faith is trusting in God as we let go of the past into the present and to the future. There was a past that you came from when you, you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord, your Savior. You're letting go into the past and you're going into the present and into the future. What is hope? Hope is expecting the best that is yet to come, right? Uh, whether it's, you're looking into eternity in His heaven or whether it's in the near future, you're hoping for the best because Christ is with you. But it says, above all these things, right? Love is greater than those. Why? Now remember, love is going to allow us the gifts. Well, you know what? Love is going to allow us faith and hope. Why? Because when heaven comes, is there going to be a need for faith? No. Is there a need for hope? No. You're in a perfect place already. But love will last all of them. So some of you lack faith. You need to take step in faith. Some of you lack hope. You need to step in hope. But if all of them start with hope and love. Why? Because it's going to last everything. Now, here's my question. If this is what it is, where do I start? Okay, again, chapter 13 is not about marriage, right? He's speaking to the church, the community of believers or people. He's challenging them to say, above this sandwich between 12, 14, and the gifts and the talent, this thing to call with love. It never gets used up because God is endless. It's a maturity, so we need to grow while we're here. And we're learning to be loved like Christ because we're, the reason, one of the reasons we're here still on earth is because God is growing us to become more Christ-like in mind. That's why love is there. So where do I get this? How do I get this? How do I become more like Christ? So let's start with Galatians 5.22. Okay? That the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. I guess there's no law. Did you get that? The fruit of the Spirit is love. I'm going back and I emphasize it. You can buy it, you can fake it, you can muster it, you can borrow it. Right? It says it's the fruit of the Spirit. Why? The capacity to love, the agape love, is only for the believer. Why? Because the Spirit of God inside of you. But the, the measure of their growth is, 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 is how much you're growing in agape love. It's the fruit. It's your manifestation that you're walking with the Spirit. So if you ask yourself, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10 this morning, where is your love level? Okay? I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm not talking about intellectual love. I'm talking about agape love. God's unconditional love. And what all that is, I mean, don't, uh, sometimes, you know, I, I look at this kind of love, and sometimes we, the problem with us, we tend to pick and choose, right? We only want to love these people this way. Listen, sometimes loving people means you have to be tough on them, right? Because you know what's better for them. Because a lot, that isn't that the way that God loves us too? I don't know many times in your life when you start disobeying God lets you go because you got to learn the hard way but you always know He's there for you. You know, when the Israelites decided to disobey God they ended up in the wilderness but then God eventually turned them around. So we tend to love the way we like to love and God says, no, I want you to love the way I love. So don't take this love and just piece pieces, you know, meaning that you only want to apply the things you want to apply in there. The fruit of the Spirit is love. So it only happens when you cooperate with Him, when you walk with Him. So if your love level is very low, my first question is, how is your walk with Christ? Right? Because don't, don't say I'm a loving person because um, you're perhaps loving for human love because uh, that's the only way we lo you know to love. So go back this morning. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to challenge you. If your love level is low, then ask yourself, am I walking with God? If you remember last week, um, we talked about the Christ must increase and we must decrease, right? So the, he talked about the, for the fruit of the Spirit to increase, the fruit of the flesh must decrease. 
So you got to look at yourself and there's things in my life, right? That the spirit of God is pointing. He's just saying, I'm walking in the flesh and I need to let go. Because unless you let go, the fruit of the spirit is not going to increase in your life. So here's my challenge. Paul talks to the church and says, listen, above everything else, search for agape love. It's there. If you're giving your life to Jesus Christ, if you're never dead, that's where you're going to start. If you have, then, then, that's, then you have to continue, you know, how am I walking with Him? Why? Because you can't give what you haven't received. You can't give what you haven't received. You can't give you, what you haven't received. So let me challenge you. Let's bow our heads. Father God, just thank you for this morning. I believe you want the best for the church. You send your son to die for it. Sometimes when we walk, walk along the way, we lost sight of that. And it's become about I. And not the community and not the church. And here in this chapter... It's an extreme challenge because you're teaching us that this kind of love goes above all things. I mean, it goes above the, all the gifts that the church seeks. And they had all of them, but they had problems because they were missing in love. You're teaching us that this is above faith and hope because this kind of love is going to be everlasting. And Father, sometimes in our lives, we're thrust into circumstances and we don't exhibit the mindset of Christ at all because we're missing this kind of love. Sometimes our decision and choice is all about us. And I pray, Father, that your spirit will speak to each one of us and, and ask ourselves, God, is the flesh showing up? Because unless we learn, learn to, to let go of the flesh, the spirit is not going to increase in our life. We can just pretend. But our actions show what's really truly happening inside. And sometimes we measure our growth in you by measuring just how much we love like you do. And I pray, Father, that we acknowledge the fact that this kind of love is never ending. Because you never give up on us, on each one of us, even when we fail. So, Father, I was as we bring our hearts to you. Show us the things in our lives we need to let go. Pierce through that walls that are we so built in our hearts that nobody else can see. And allow us to see just what is inhibiting this kind of love in our lives. And I pray that as we extend our hands, you can just start filling it up. Because you want to give it to us. You're giving it to us, the cross. And you want to give it us over and over and over again. So Father, as we tend to our day and our week and the choices that we have to make, may we filter with love first. Not our love, not the world's love, but this type of agape love that you so much want to build in our lives. So show us the way, show us the path, show us the steps that we need to make. In a world that is so divided, they need to see a united church. And this is step number one. So we surrender to you, God. Fill us with your love. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church. We'll see you around the world in another few weeks.